Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Reese, and I'm the CEO and Executive Director of Wyoming Humanities. Welcome to our latest edition of Wyoming Connections. Today, we're going to talk about the Constitution and why it should matter to you. This is part of a larger initiative of Wyoming Humanities that uh, we're performing in conjunction with the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative, which is administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. In essence, we're, we're looking at ways in which being a citizen plays a role in our personal lives, how we interact in our communities, and certainly how we engage with the state and federal government. The aspects of civic engagement that we're looking at involve um, how we communicate with, with other people, how we uh, develop trust, how we get our news, how we participate. But also important is our connection to the Constitution. Often we see the Constitution as a government document written for the government, and we've lost sight of how it affects us as people. So today we're going to uh, we're, we're going to hear from not only a, a constitutional scholar, Dr. David Adler, who is our moderator, but also Wyoming citizens from across the state at different ages who all have a different connection to the Constitution. And they're going to describe that aspect of uh, the Constitution in their lives um, and in their communities. So I'd first of all like to introduce to uh, our audience, our moderator, Dr. Adler. Uh, Dr. Adler is the president of the Alturas Institute, which is a nonprofit organization created uh, to promote the Constitution, gender equality, and civic in education. Dr. Adler is a nationally recognized speaker, internationally recognized expert in the Constitution. He is uh, author of many books, six books, I believe, including the most recent, which is called The War, Power, and an Age of Terrorism. He's also uh, very prolific in writing scholarly articles about the Constitution, and in fact, um, Wyoming Humanities is a proud partner, along with others, in uh, sponsoring uh, columns that Dr. Adler is writing for newspapers across the state of Wyoming. With that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Dr. Adler. I appreciate it. It's great to be with you and uh, every, everybody else on our line today. I'm excited about, I'm excited about this program and really appreciate uh, the fact that you've included me in this. Thank you. And uh, studying the Constitution is near and dear to my heart, and promoting public dialogue is so welcome in our time. And so I appreciate Wyoming Humanities for sponsoring this program. Uh, of course, our program uh, draws on the very popular We the People program, which is uh, housed in the Center for Civic Education in California. And for those of you not familiar with this terrific program, let me tell you, it is an, it deserves an A plus for promoting students' knowledge and understanding about the Constitution and broadening the public's uh, understanding of how our constitutional system works. This is a terrific program in which students spend an entire year studying the Constitution, preparing for a competition at the end of the year in which they go before uh, judges first at the state level and then if they qualify at the national level uh, to answer uh, very difficult challenging questions posed to them by judges uh, and it resembles very much a congressional hearing and I've had the good fortune of serving as a national judge uh, for many years and I cannot tell you how very impressed I am with the ability of the students uh, to talk about difficult constitutional questions uh, and to demonstrate considerable knowledge. And I'll tell you, having taught for many years at the university level, I'm always impressed with the knowledge that graduates of We the People programs bring to my classroom and their head and shoulders above those students who did not have that good fortune 
We do have four very good speakers today, and it's my pleasure as moderator uh, to introduce them to the audience. Uh, the first is, in fact, a graduate of the We the People program. She is Claire Schnatterbeck, who is now an undergraduate at Columbia University in New York, where she is majoring in political science. She grew up in Sheridan, Wyoming, and she has been enmeshed in publications involving politics and the Constitution, and she is enjoying her opportunity at Columbia to pursue the many opportunities that a great university provides for its students. And she tells us that she developed her love for the Constitution when she was a student in Sheridan participating in the We the People program. We look forward to hearing from Claire. Our next speaker would be Darren Shear, who is an attorney who lives in Farson and works remotely for a law firm based in Casper. He works on large natural resource development projects in the Mountain West, including oil and gas, wind and solar. Darren has been involved with the We the People program as a judge for several years and has been fascinated by the Constitution since his days in high school. Outside of work, uh, Darren's a volunteer fireman, a pilot, a raft guide, and a swift water rescue instructor. He lives an adventurous life. He graduated with honors from the University of Wyoming and then earned his law degree at the University of Washington. We'll look forward to hearing from Darren. And then our next speaker is Diomina Mercer, a high school student in Sheridan. Uh, she's a junior there uh, who's a very, very busy young woman. She just finished the We the People program uh, at her high school and uh, she competed in the program. Uh, something that she enjoyed very, very much. Uh, she's also vice president of the speech and debate team and a recruitment director for Young Americans for Liberty in Wyoming. She's also a member of the school choir. Frankly, I don't know how she finds time to do all this. It's, we're looking forward to hearing from Diomina a little bit later. And then our fourth and final speaker will be Mike Morris, who's employed with the Department of Environmental Quality in Cheyenne. Uh, he, is an, he is a Wyoming native. Uh, his work there at the DEQ is in the Air Quality Division, and he works predominantly uh, focusing on, on assessing and implementing, implementing state and federal level regulations and policies, as well as communications and public outreach. Prior to returning to Cheyenne, and you'll love this, Mike had the wonderful opportunity work, to work with the team media staff of the Denver Broncos where he covered Super Bowl 48 uh, and stood in line behind Peyton Manning. Mike has also participated in the We the People program as a senior uh, at Central High and he is an adamant proponent for civic education and community engagement. And so ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to begin uh, our presentations by turning uh, first of all, to Claire Schnatterbeck, our student from Columbia University, and Claire is going to be talking about the Ninth Amendment. The floor is all yours, Claire. Please go ahead. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Adler, for the wonderful introduction. Um, when preparing to speak today, I thought a lot about which amendment I wanted to discuss, because honestly, there are so many aspects of my life that I feel are directly impacted by the Constitution. For example, I'm a university student with the goal of being a journalist, so I considered talking about the First Amendment and freedom of the press. I'm also a woman who is very empowered by my ability to vote for the first time in the 2020 election, so I considered discussing the implications of the 19th Amendment and that gave women suffrage. But in the end, today, I've decided to talk about what I consider to be one of the most elusive amendments of the Constitution, but also one of the most important, the Ninth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment is just one sentence, but it holds so much power. It says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. In more modern language, this means that the Constitution is not a finite list of rights that the government can use to control every aspect of your life. This amendment says that just because a certain right is not explicitly listed in the Constitution does not mean you don't have that right. So why include the Ninth Amendment in the Bill of Rights at all? 
Well, its conception sprung from the conflict between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Federalists wanted a strong central government for states to band together, but they argued that the Constitution didn't need a Bill of Rights because it would just limit the rights instead of protecting them. Um, Anti-Federalists believed the opposite. So, in federal, so the founders decided to include the Ninth Amendment as basically a catch-all to say, these are just some of the rights you have, not all, we'll just figure out the rest in time, but just know that you do have these rights, even if they're not explicitly listed. So now that like technical definition of the amendment is over, why does this amendment matter to me specifically as a Wyoming resident? Well, not only does it give me to do to give me the right to do things in my everyday life. I mean, nowhere in the Constitution does it say I explicitly have the right to brush my teeth in the morning or eat toast for breakfast, but it has been used to decide Supreme Court cases and other things to expand on the rights that are listed in the Constitution. Earlier, I mentioned that I want to pursue journalism. Well, the Ninth Amendment was used to decide Richmond newspapers v. Virginia, which revealed the right of the public and the press to observe criminal trials. There's precedent to use the Ninth Amendment to expand the rights of the press. I also mentioned how my identity as a woman is an important aspect of how I see the world interact day to day and specifically interact with the Constitution. I won't get into the nitty gritty of the case, but the Supreme Court case Griswold v. Connecticut set the precedent for the right to birth control and contraceptives, albeit for married women with the permission of their husbands, but nevertheless, Female bodies were basically completely left out of the Constitution initially, but this case expanded on the right to privacy, specifically in the realm of women's bodies and their bodily autonomy, which is a very important thing to me. This was one of the first times it was demonstrated that a new right must also be protective, the right to privacy, even if it's not explicitly in the Constitution. Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas delivered the majority opinion in Griswold, stating that specific guarantees in the Bill of Rights have penumbras formed by emanation for those guarantees that help give them life and substance. He refers to the Ninth Amendment as a penumbra, which I love. Um, and if you want to hear more about that, I would totally recommend watching um, Heidi Schreck's amazing Broadway play, What the Constitution Means to Me. It's very similar to this prompt we are given today. It's on Amazon. It's amazing. Highly recommend it. But basically, the Ninth Amendment as a penumbra, a penumbra is a shadowy space stuck between what we can see and what we can't see. The penumbra of the Ninth Amendment demonstrates that although we can't see them clearly, there are more rights that are protected and that we will uncover. So now that I've said why I care about this and what it is, why should Wyomingites care? I try to never do this, but when I, um, because I know it never improves my mood, but I looked at the Facebook comments under this event and I saw a lot of combative, angry comments about the Constitution. Someone claimed that the Constitution itself betrays the Bill of Rights, referring to it as authoritarian. Another re person referred to merely discussing the Constitution like we're doing today as some form of indoctrination. I don't know into what, but moving on. But honestly, I think these people would actually like the Ninth Amendment. Wyomingites who dislike large government should look into the original ideas around the Ninth Amendment because it says the government and the Constitution can't say all the rights you have. It actually limits what the government can do. For people who say the government can't tell me what to do, well, that's kind of what the Ninth Amendment is saying. It the Ninth Amendment offers a constitutional safety net intended to make it clear that Wyoming, the Amer Americans and Wyomingites, I guess, um, have other fundamental rights beyond what's just listed, listed in the Bill of Rights. It's up to the courts to decide what they are exactly. All in all, I feel like the Ninth Amendment is very honest. It doesn't tell you all the rights you have because it just simply doesn't know. The Ninth Amendment acknowledges who we are now might not be who we will become. It gives America and Wyoming room to grow and adapt to changing times and ideals. It emphasizes how I believe American democracy should be retained by the people. I believe we should take note from the Constitution and the Ninth Amendment and go through life knowing that who we are now might not be who we will become. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. I'd now like to pass it over to our next presenter, um, Darren. Thank you very much, Claire. I uh, appreciate it. The US Constitution is one of the most amazing documents ever drafted. Written over 200 years ago, the original seven articles ran a grand total of only four pages. In those four pages, ratified in 1788, the framers divided power between the three branches of the federal government, and they codified the concept of federalism by which power is shared between the federal government and the states. 
1789, Congress began considering the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, which we commonly refer to as the Bill of Rights. Those 10 amendments came about largely because of the concerns about the government having too much power under the terms of the original seven articles. Those first 10 amendments were ratified in 1791 and they all fit on one additional page of parchment. So here we are more than 200 years later, still talking about five pages. How's that possible? How could the framers living in the late 1700s have possibly contemplated the types of challenges that we'd be facing now in the 21st century? How could those seven articles and 10 amendments still be relevant at all? How could they form the basis of the only democracy in the world to last continuously for more than 200 years? My answer to that question is this. In drafting the constitution, the framers understood the critical importance of balancing rights with responsibilities. To explain what I mean, let me give you a simple example. Two men are sitting in a bar. One man starts swinging his arm around and says, is this not a free country? The other replies, yes, sir, it is. First man says, have I not a right to swing my arm? The second man replies, yes, but your right to swing your arm ends just where my nose begins. So the freedom to swing your arm or express your opinion or own a gun or practice your religion is a right that's recognized and guaranteed under the Constitution. But the obligation not to punch someone else in the nose or to use our free speech to incite violence or to use your gun in a reckless way that might harm others, those are the responsibilities that accompany those rights. As the philosopher Hayek said, liberty and responsibility are inseparable. This I think is the brilliance behind the Constitution and the magic that's allowed this document and these principles to endure and to remain meaningful for more than two centuries. And this is the reason that I chose this topic for my talk today. The Constitution is about balance. And when that balance gets out of whack, I believe we dishonor the spirit and the intent of the framers. By selfishly focusing only on our rights without acknowledging and understanding the responsibilities that accompany those rights, we miss the point entirely. Take the First Amendment, for example. Freedom of speech and the right to freely assemble are two of the most important rights guaranteed under the Constitution. They're so important that the US Supreme Court allowed neo-Nazis to hold a march in the streets of Skokie, Illinois, where many Holocaust survivors lived. But those were the same rights that civil rights workers relied on in the 1960s when Southern cities tried to shut down their marches by claiming that the protests would cause disruption and violence. In order to ensure the right of those freedom riders to march in the South, we have the responsibility to protect that same freedom of speech for those with whom we strongly disagree. These exact same issues have been debated regularly over the past year with protesters of all types marching in the streets of our country about various causes, including racism, police brutality, anti-mask protests, et cetera, et cetera. Regardless of whether you agree or disagree with any of these causes, the constitution recognizes that in order to exercise your right of free speech and free assembly, to talk about the things that you care about, you have the responsibility to allow others to do the same, even if you strongly disagree with them. People tend to think of the Constitution as a document that grants affirmative rights, the right to free speech, the right to free assembly, the right to practice your religion. I think this is actually incorrect. The Constitution is a limiting document that prescribes the government's power to control or limit the natural rights that you already have. Those rights, including the right to be free from unlawful search and seizure, from excessive force, the right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself, and the right to privacy, these are actually what I would call negative rights. They are, they are the right to be left alone by your government. This important balancing doesn't just apply to the relationship between the government and its people. It also applies to the relationship between the federal government and the states. Under the 10th Amendment, all powers not delegated to the federal government by the Constitution are expressly reserved to the states. This means that although the Constitution grants specific powers to the federal government, such as the power to tax and the power to declare war, one of the biggest purposes of the Constitution is to limit the federal government's ability to interfere with all of the other rights that the states already possess. In essence, the 10th Amendment represents the state's right to be left alone by the federal government, except in those areas, especially enumerated by the Constitution. So here's what I hope that you'll take away from my talk today. First, the Constitution isn't some dusty old document that doesn't matter anymore. Because of the brilliant balance that the framers negotiated, 
The Constitution still affects our daily lives and is just as important now as it was when it was drafted. Second, in many important ways, the Constitution is primarily a limiting document. The Constitution, and especially the first 10 amendments, spends an awful lot of time telling the government what it can't do because people and the states largely have the negative right to be left alone. That's what liberty is all about. But lastly, I want to stress that the most important thing about the rights guaranteed under the Constitution are the responsibilities that come with them. Psychologist Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, said this, freedom is not the last word. Freedom is only part of the story and half of the truth. Freedom is but the negative aspect of the whole phenomenon whose positive aspect is responsibleness. In fact, freedom is in danger of degenerating into mere arbitrariness unless it is lived in terms of responsibleness. So in closing, I'd leave you with this thought to ponder. Insisting on your rights without acknowledging your responsibilities isn't freedom, it's childishness. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll turn it over to Diamina. Hi there. Um, so everything that Claire and Darren had said, I think are wonderful points, but I would like to touch on the first and second amendments. So the first amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So I think that two of the most important things in this amendment are the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion because under tyranny, those are the first two rights that are left that are forced to be taken away from the people. And what I think was genius was that this was the first amendment in the constitution put in there by James Madison. And a lot of people don't know this, but James Madison actually took 200 different amendment proposals and whittled it down to 12. And then 10 of them were ratified by the states, but they made this one the first one because it was so incredibly important that these be the first and foremost rights given to the people. And so, I think that freedom of speech, this is kind of a controversial opinion, but hate speech is free speech in the sense that it's like a free market of speech. So people can decide what they think is right and wrong. And, al and it allows people to be more educated on different ideas. And something that is more of a responsibility is that civil discourse. It's not just a right, it's a duty to the citizens of the, of the United States. Um, I also think that compromise is extremely important in this because with those differing ideas, especially in, in today's political atmosphere, you see that compromise is a four letter word and even Congress is split straight down the middle because no one wants to talk to each other because why would they do that when they can just butt heads with each other? But I would like to spend a little more time on the second amendment because it's second most important, but it says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of, the free, of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So I want to define a couple words in here. So the first one being well-regulated, which means disciplined and in peak performance conditions. So well-regulated militia is talking about each state has their own sort of personal army to protect the state. And as we've seen in the past, it can be called upon by the federal government, which is the National Guard. And then also infringed is a word that people sometimes leave out of this amendment. Infringed is to act so as to limit or undermine or to encroach upon. So again, I think that every restrictive gum law is unconstitutional because it's encroaching upon the right of the people to keep and bear arms. And cases like uh, DC v. Heller and McDonald v. Chicago affirm the right for people to keep and bear arms. There's also a case currently that the Supreme Court is going to speak on very soon, if they have not already, 
and it's against New York. And in New York, you're not allowed to carry your gun outside of your home unless you can demonstrate a viable reason that you need it beyond personal self-protection, which I think is absolutely ludicrous because it says that the people have the right to keep and bear arms and it shall not be infringed. And one of the founding father's greatest fears was that the government would use the army to oppress the people, which actually ties into the third amendment, which says that the government will not require private citizens to house troops in their homes. So the founding father's whole idea of the second amendment was so that the people can protect themselves from outside threats and from the government itself, because they knew even if the government had their limiting document being the constitution with the necessary and proper clause, they could actually in a way overstep their bounds. And so the second amendment is actually a check for the people themselves to protect themselves against the government. So, Another thing that I want to touch on is that gun control is never going to work in the United States because you cannot have effective gun control where in a country where guns are guaranteed by the Constitution. Like you see in England, people talk about how there's virtually no gun violence because they banned guns, but that can't happen in the United States because they're guaranteed by our government's limiting document. And as we can see is that though guns were banned in the UK, the knife crime rate went up. So there's really no way to stop these bad people from getting things and ways to harm people. So why I think that people should, or Wyomingites should be concerned about the second amendment is because it's your right to defend yourself and your property. Ronald Reagan even said that self-defense is not just a right, it's a duty. So it's our duty as a community and as the people of the United States to protect our freedom and ourselves. Because again, as Ronald Reagan said, freedom only comes once to a people. And those who have known it and then lost it have never seen it again. So I would like to turn it over to Mr. Morris now. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Diamina, and, and well done to everyone who's come before me, and uh, thanks for having me on this. Um, I do want to start off by saying that these are, you know, my personal views and not those of any organization I'm affiliated with, but uh, I wanted to frame the relevance of the Constitution to a couple of really unique and important professional and personal experiences that I've had. Uh, one, as Dr. Adler mentioned, when I was younger, my career was working with the Denver Broncos team media staff. And then the other is in a capacity I currently serve, the vice president of the board of directors of Art Cheyenne, which is a 501c3 uh, dedicated to achieving community enhancement through accessible art programming and cultural enrichment. Um, I volunteer organized uh, a number of music festivals and concert series with musicians and artists from all over the country, uh, all different walks, races, nationalities, ideologies, etc. Uh, during my time with that organization. Um, so how and why tie the Constitution to these uh, formative experiences for me? Uh, quite frankly, the U.S. Constitution is the foundation that delineates the rights for the free expression and participation in both of these avenues. Um, the First Amendment and Ninth Amendment immediately come to mind. Uh, the First Amendment, of course, is a perpetual component to our everyday discourse, and it uh, outlines rights that are fundamental to so many forms of expression and activity that we enjoy. Uh, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. Uh, this clause secures the capacity for venues like sports, art, and so many other forms of <clears throat> expression to take place. And uh, as a performing musician myself, uh, this is again near and dear because it allows me to <clears throat> largely compose and perform music that represents my personal philosophies and perspectives without fear of persecution. And, 
That's something I take for granted. I'm guilty of that sometimes because it's a privilege not all people in the world enjoy. Uh, a good friend of mine spent a year in Eritrean prison uh, for simply speaking out against the government. And we have protections under the Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments for due process, impartial juries, cruel and unusual punishments, and things of that nature. So the First Amendment lays out a very broad series of rights, and then they're further supplemented by the Ninth Amendment. Uh, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Uh, in essence, individuals have other fundamental rights that are not specifically delineated in the First through Eighth Amendments. Um, both of those amendments, in, in theory, in the contemporary U.S., secure the ability for individuals to live autonomously within the law and articulate and engage in a wide range of expressive activities. Uh, which again is critical in both venues I talked about. Furthermore, the freedom of the press granted in the First Amendment is particularly important to me as someone who worked in various capacities in the media. And I have an immense amount of respect for journalists and the manner in which they hold the local, state, and federal governments, as well as other powerful entities, in check with the powers they're granted in the Constitution. Uh, I do believe, however, that there are technological advancements that are just way beyond the foresight of the founders uh, that do call for some conversation about where those limits are drawn. Of course, many of these rights were denied historically to certain groups of marginalized people, and there still is a fight today. I've worked with so many athletes and artists who are people of color, uh, women, immigrants, LGBTQ, et cetera, whose, whose rights have been historically limited and are secured in later amendments to an extent. And I've forged deep friendships, both through these capacities and outside of them, with people who've been affected by them. The 13th Amendment, ending slavery. The 14th, which inhibits states from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, and eliminated the three-fifths rule and overturned the awful Dred Scott decision. Uh, it also provides equal protection under law and substantive due process, which has been crucial to the protection of some important civil liberties over the years. Uh, and the 15th, in theory, uh, securing voting rights for male citizens regardless of race. And the 19th, securing voting rights for women. Uh, all of them are profoundly important. But in practice, they did not secure all these rights. Um, there are parts of the Constitution that helped further some. Uh, the Commerce Clause in Article 1, Section 8 was essential to the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, uh, which confronted a lot of racial discrimination and helped establish the 24th Amendment that ended discriminatory poll taxes and literary tests and things like that. Uh, however, there are still many groups of people who feel like they're disenfranchised of many rights. And that's why expression is so pivotal for many athletes and artists. Again, male and female, people of color, LGBTQ, immigrants, et cetera, to further the push for these rights. Um, prominent athletes and artists continue to regularly express their perspectives and are protected under the Constitution to do so. Um, in athletics, this has happened at the professional and collegiate level with athletes raising their concerns over societal issues. Um, that battle was denied in the Black 14 incident at the University of Wyoming in 1969, uh, which really was a stain on UW for some time, although the university recently issued a formal apology for what happened. But for me, these are just such critical movements for so many people who are important to me and who I cherish, and the Constitution is fundamental to furthering those rights. And that's really why civic education and civic engagement, uh, putting these constitutional rights into practice is so meaningful to me. And uh, at that, I will pass it back to Dr. Adler. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. And let me say, I thoroughly enjoyed each of the presentations and uh, obviously our speakers demonstrated considerable knowledge on uh, the areas that they discussed. I see emerging, a theme here, and that is the question, uh, are the rights in the Constitution, uh, specifically in the Bill of Rights, limited, or are they absolute? You heard the case being made by uh, Darren uh, that there's, a, there's the need to balance rights and responsibilities. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, Diomena 
seem to lean more closely to the uh, viewpoint that Second Amendment rights are absolute. So let's see where we stand uh, by pursuing this theme uh, with respect to particular questions. And in doing this, we are essentially following the format employed by the We the People program where a judge pitches questions uh, to the students. So let's go back to Claire, who gave a wonderful talk about the Ninth Amendment, hitting the highlights of, of Griswold versus Connecticut. Uh, and she was certainly right to say that it is uh, one of the perhaps least understood rights in the Bill of Rights, but certainly important. So Claire, let me ask you, uh, given your view that the court can create rights, as I think you indicated it did when it created the right of privacy in Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965, how should the court go about the business of identifying or discovering rights uh, that are embodied in the Ninth Amendment? Is there a particular way? For example, Justice Douglas believed the Ninth Amendment, as you pointed out, includes the right to privacy, but as you know, Justice Black dissented in that case and said he likes his privacy as well as anybody, but he doesn't see it in the Ninth Amendment. This is a bit of a problem, right? What would you say? Hmm, let me think about that. Um, I, I mean, since I cited it in my speech, I would disagree with Justice Black and side more with Justice Douglas that, um, you know, we, through like specific circumstances such as in Griswold v. Connecticut, um, we can see these rights. But of course, in Griswold v. Connecticut, it wasn't the only, uh, the Ninth Amendment wasn't the only amendment used to discover this new right. It was also the 14th Amendment and talking about due process. So when, you know, saying we're discovering new rights, like, or creating new rights, I, I see it more as like, just like, wading through the penumbra and seeing they were already there, they were written, because, you know, they're, we can find them in the, you know, by using the Constitution as an entire document um, to see where the rights might be. I don't know, does that? You know, I think that's a good answer. And I think, I think you're right that the, the court did look at all the penumbral rights, as, as you pointed out. Um, and certainly the right to privacy, as you pointed out, was essential uh, to young women and women of all ages, giving them access to uh, the, the birth control pill and contraceptives. Does it surprise you that it took the court or our country so long to recognize the right of women to access contraceptives? I, I am, in some ways I am surprised, in other ways it definitely fit with like, you know, the course of history, like you know, it's only been a hundred years or a little over now a hundred years since women could vote and i referenced that like women's bodies were basically left out of the constitution when the constitution was written people it was referring to like white land-owning men um so of course it took lots of time to um you know get to the point where we even saw women as citizens who in think of the constitution and the laws as applying to them, such as um, the right to privacy and birth control. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I personally think it should have been sooner, of course, but mm -hmm. it, it makes sense in the course of history. Thank you very much. Uh, turning to Darren, who gave us a very nice talk, talking about the importance in the constitutional system of balancing rights with responsibilities and invoking uh, the famous philosopher Friedrich Hayek. I enjoyed that very much. So here's a question that brings us right up to uh, current times and current issues, right to your doorstep. As every American knows, the COVID vaccine is available across the country, but some people decide they don't want to uh, have the COVID shot. They're not going to access the vaccine. In your view, given the uh, need to balance rights and responsibilities, and given the Met, what medical science says about the value of the COVID vaccine. Do you believe that people, the, that people have an obligation uh, to receive the vaccine as opposed to a freedom to say no? This is a tough question. It is a tough question. Um, and, and it's a personal question, quite frankly. I, I live in a community that is 
uh, fairly resistant to uh, mask mandates, for instance. I live in a state that's fairly resistant to mask mandates. Um, and I can understand some of those concerns. Um, at the same time, uh, I attended to the bedside of my stepmom when she passed away in December from COVID and uh, my father who passed away from COVID six days later. So uh, it's real, it's very personal and uh, it has an effect on people. And so um, for me, I think it's less about the constitutional issue. Uh, I, I believe that there is a balance of rights and responsibilities and I understand the symbolism of, of being forced to do something by your government. I think it's unfortunate that the science around the issue has become politicized, whether it's masks or vaccines or what have you. And to be honest with you, um, I'm reminded of Ben Franklin's quote when they were putting together the constitution in the first place. He said, uh, you know, we, we all need to hang together or we're gonna hang separately. And, and I feel like that's where we're going as a nation. I think that people have politicized these issues. They, they're, they're reflecting more on the symbolism of the issue than the practical reality. And I, I wish that we would put the amount of effort that people seem to have put into uh, demagoguery and demonizing and, and uh, going to extremes on one end or the other, either way. Uh, I wish we would put that effort into working together and, and coming to some consensus on science and, and some consensus on, um, on how best to, to live together with one another to really believe that we are all in this together. Because I think that's what the framers intended. And I think that that was the balance of rights and responsibilities that they were seeking. So um, I, I'll bet you that the framers themselves would have probably violently disagreed on this question about whether the government can force you to take a shot or the government can force you to wear a mask. But I would say that the, the burden, especially on the mask issue, the burden that's imposed by something like that in my mind is relatively small compared to the potential public good. And I think those are the types of equations that the framers were talking about. And I think those are the types of questions that we're asked, should be asking ourselves. And I think if we instead focus on symbolism, we tend to miss the forest for the trees. Thank you very much, Jaron. I have another question, but we'll come back to you in, in just a little bit. Thanks. Diomena, I was so impressed with your presentation uh, covering uh, the expansive rights in the First Amendment and of course the important Second Amendment. And, and it occurred to me to ask you, do you believe that, that we have absolute rights under the Constitution, or in your view, are all rights limited to some degree by the exercise of governmental power? Um, well, I do understand that there actually are limitations to free speech, like in Shank v. United States with the time, place, manner, and clear and present danger statutes. And I do agree that you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, but again, as I mentioned earlier, it's like a free market of speech and people can see the different sides and come up with their own points of views and then figure out right from wrong. And even as Mr. Shear has said, we all have a responsibility to know our rights, but we need, <sighs> basically I have more of an individualist view where is, whereas do what you're doing as long as you're not hurting me, I'll do what I'm doing as long as I'm not hurting you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you, you, you agree that First Amendment rights are limited in the area of speech, and I assume religion as well, but do you take the view that the Second Amendment um, provides an unlimited rights, that there can be no restrictions, no regulations, uh, and if that's true, then you would be at odds with what the court said in the Heller case, where Justice Scalia said, uh, that the usual restrictions or regulations are still intact. How do you sort that out? I don't know if you've had time to think about that. Maybe you could take a uh, quick crack at it. Well, I don't think that a background check is necessarily a bad idea, but I don't think that, that they should delve so far into someone's personal life to figure out if they can have a gun or not for their own self-protection. I think that's also a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So you would uphold some regulations, but not others, basically? In a way, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. It's, Thank it's a very difficult thing to talk about because there's this element to think about. There's this other thing to think about. So, right. But as, 
you know, Switzerland actually requires everyone to own a gun and to go through safety courses. They even have shooting competitions every year for children 13 to 17. And they have not, that was implemented in 2001, I believe, and they have not had any mass shootings or large accounts of, of gun violence since. Interesting. So one question that we'd want to think about, I don't think we're going to be able to do it today, maybe, is that if if the Second Amendment stands alone as protecting absolute rights and all of the other rights and liberties are limited, we'd want to ask where in the Second Amendment do we find that it's an absolute right, whereas other rights in the First Amendment, et cetera, are limited. Something to think about. Maybe we can come back to that because we'll have some questions from the audience. So thank you. Thank you very much. And Mike and in the few minutes we have left in this segment before we invite audience questions, I really enjoyed your, your comments about how the Constitution applies uh, to areas in your professional life. And Americans may not think about how important freedom of expression is to artists all the time, whether it's in music or elsewhere. Can, how are, Have you thought much about where you might draw a line in terms of protecting artistic expression when it comes to First Amendment protection. That's a, that's a tough one. Have you given any thought where you might draw a line? Yeah, I mean, it is very difficult to delineate um, and it's, it's very relevant today. I mean, first of all, it sort of depends on what you classify as art. I mean, uh, when I mentioned that there have been technological advancements way beyond what the founding fathers could have foreseen, something that actually is only uh, in its nascent phases is deep fake technology. And to an extent, you know, video is a, a media form of art. Uh, to me, you know, if, if a deep fake occurred to James Madison talking about seceding back to Britain, I don't think that he would have been on board with an unlimited, uh, I mean, you know, if in part falls under libel, but at this juncture, it's unclear where it falls. <laughs> Um, you know, when it when it comes to, uh, I don't know, graphic art, uh, you know, uh, performing art, I, I think it the clear and present danger clause is, is a very important thing to consider. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know, it's, it's very difficult to draw the line between, you know, say, a, a very inciting uh, performance that uh, I, I guess it, it just depends on what it incites and, and whether or not it does uh, incur, you know, something violent, in my it, opinion. You know, that I, it's a really tricky question because if we get into the lyrics of rap artists, just to take one example, when do some of the lyrics incite to the point where it's not protected speech? That's, that's a pretty tough question, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's not limited to rap either. You know, I think it's uh, across media. Um, you know, I, I think that there is an instance where a couple of rappers in, in New York were uh, sentenced on account of their lyrics, you know, detailing real life events where, uh, you know, I mean, murders and things actually happened. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know right now if I can give you a definitive line. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I lean on allowing quite a bit of leeway, but um, as things evolve, it's it's becoming a, a need to revisit this, I think. Thank you, Mike. Uh, right, we don't expect any definitive answers today. But you know, uh, folks, one of the great signs of the quality presentations that you've heard is the fact that they have generated so many questions. So we're at the point in our program now where we can turn to some of those those questions from the audience. And I see we have several already. So uh, let's turn to, to these as quickly as we can. Uh, the first ask, what about the Fifth Amendment Convention of States and applying it in this time when our Congress and executive branches are obviously out of sync with many Americans? Wow, there is a question that goes right to the heart of a lot of controversies today. Uh, let me pose this question, uh, first of all, uh, to Claire, uh, to gauge your interest in uh, assessing whether or not it's time for the states to call for a constitutional convention to try to remedy some of the imbalances that people perceive to be occurring in Congress and the executive. 
Yeah, no. Um, I mean, I, I think there are definitely changes that need to be made um, to the constitution in order to, you know, remedy a lot of the, you know, divisiveness and polarization at the federal level. Um, I think a lot of that does stem, I would, my one question would be, would that just be recreated in a constitutional convention because there is also polarization between, you know, Democrat, Republican within, you know, the states as well. So my question would be, would it, my question to the question, I guess, would be, would this be a good solution or would it just be a continuation of the same problem? I know that doesn't necessarily answer the question, but no, that's what but I, I think of. <laughs> I like your approach because it shows an active mind answering a question with a question. So the best people to do that are attorneys. Let's turn to Darren. And um, uh, because here we have a master of a person asking a question uh, in response to a question, but Darren, quickly, uh, do you think, given your emphasis on balance and imbalance between rights and responsibilities, if you enlarge that a little bit, have we reached the point in America where it's time to hold a, another con a constitutional convention to address these concerns? I would say that I'm not the person to answer whether we've reached the point or not, but what I would say is that the framers provided a mechanism to amend the constitution. And, and if there's enough of a critical mass uh, that want that to happen, then, then that mechanism is available. At the same time, I would say that part of the brilliance of the constitution is this system of checks and balances and this balance of power that, that basically results in incrementalism. So people complain about gridlock in our, in our system, for instance, but in some ways, uh, gridlock prevents extremes and uh, on one end or the other. And so to the extent that people are, are advocating for a constitutional convention or for amendment of the constitution, my only question would be, are, are you doing that for the betterment of the country? Are you doing that in a way that's going to push us forward together? Or are you doing it in a way that's going to swing the pendulum to one side? Because eventually the pendulum is going to swing back. And so um, I actually think it was part of the brilliance of the framers that they put the, I guess I would call them fire breaks in the constitution uh, in order to avoid that type of radical pendulum swing back and forth. And it's more of an incrementalist system. So whether the convention is appropriate or not, I don't know, but um, I'm glad that they set it up the way they did. It's a nice answer, thank you. Uh, let's turn to another question that really is good for everybody on our panel today. If I shorten this good question just a little bit, let me return to the theme. Do our panelists believe that the rights protected by the Bill of Rights are absolute? Uh, we ask that um, pretty closely of Diomena, uh, but let's let's go back. Let's go back to Mike to ask in a general way. Do you think the rights are limited or unlimited? And in your view, under what circumstances might some rights be limited? Yeah, I'm a proponent of uh, limitations. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm a proponent of uh, limitations of, of First Amendment rights when they present a, a clear and present danger, um, particularly in my mind when uh, they coincide with uh, potentially deadly weapons at the same time. I think that, I don't know, in my mind, uh, it brings me back to John Locke, which is uh, where, you know, a lot of constitutional provision or, you know, principles derive from, but we enter into a social contract. And I, I think that, you know, unlimited rights can violate that social contract. So um, in the sake of time, I'll sort of leave it at that. But, um, you know, and sorry if that's vague, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a believer that, you know, Locke really in his principles got it that. Right, thank you. So Claire, if we turn to you, given your, your uh, passion for the Ninth Amendment, uh, if, if you believe that rights are limited, how would you go about the business of deciding when rights might be limited? Well, in the um, Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment, it talks about due process, that like the rights to like life, liberty, property, et cetera, a lot of the rights in, you know, that are major ideas in the Bill of Rights cannot be, you know, infringed on without due process. So in, in that case, if like due process has been done, I see that as a time where, okay, you can limit those rights. But I would also agree with uh, Mike about the clear and present danger. If there 
is necessity for the protection and safety of the nation, of the state, of the you know citizens, then it's important to um, think about um, limiting such rights so to protect and for the betterment of the entire population. Good, thank you. We'll, we'll move on in the interest of time. Uh, here's a really interesting question. This goes to Darren, but I wanna ask the others. This goes back to the question of swinging your arms in, a, in the bar. Refusal to get vaccinated against COVID is common in Wyoming, as you said. Uh, this means that we will not reach her, uh, herd immunity, which means that new variants will develop, killing more innocent people. Not getting vaccinated is posed as a question of liberty, but do we have a responsibility to our community and our country to get vaccinated? And you address that. So let me, sh let me shift this slightly in a way that everybody will certainly understand. Do we as citizens, drivers of automobiles, have a duty when we come to a red light to stop or do we feel it's an exercise in our freedom to run the red light as a matter of personal choice? Um, let's let's go first to Darren for a quick response, please. Um, you know, I, I agree with what Mike said in terms of the the idea of a social compact, and and you know we've got to figure out how to how to do this all together. I guess I would also go back to the quote from Frankel, uh, which is that freedom is in danger of degenerating into mere arbitrariness unless it's lived in terms of responsibleness. So whether to make that mandatory or not, that's a different question. But just in terms of each individual person's, mm -hmm. each individual citizen's obligation, I think they should weigh that balance between freedoms and, and responsibility to, to one another. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's, go, let's go to Mike and, and ask Mike uh, in a different way, do you believe that uh, those driving automobiles have a duty to stop when they come to a red light? Because isn't this, analogous to this question of refusing a vaccine, if it can bring harm on others, bring harm to others. Yeah, well, I, I'm not a, a lawyer, but I, if I understand correctly, I mean, that's part of traffic law. Um, you know, I, in my personal opinion, I would, I would wish that people would you know, vaccinate. I, I, I guess though, I, I don't, I wouldn't be able to identify where in the law it's enforceable right now. Where I would need more help. I mean, would it require the passage of another law? Um, it seems to get into vague territory for me um, mm -hmm. as far as where the enforceability lies. Um, personally, yeah, I, I wish that there was some degree of limitation on that that would incline people to. But uh, of course, uh, you know, there are very real concerns, just like taking an antibiotic that could have a very negative side effect that some people really might not be able to get their head around. So um, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult, it's difficult. Hey, thank you. Let's turn to our students and, and get a quick response. Uh, Diomena, do you believe that people have a responsibility to become vaccinated? I think that first and foremost, people have the responsibility to be educated. Um, the vaccine hasn't been properly tested. It was rushed in eight months and even we can see with influenza, we've had the vaccine for over 100 years and it's still not 100% effective. So how can we think that a vaccine that's actually been proven to only be 66% effective in eight months without proper test, like long-term testing, how can we trust that? We can even look to the CDC and it says that the mortality rate of COVID-19 is 0.04%. And we could see that in 2020, versus 2019, more people died, excuse me, fewer people died in 2020 overall, including COVID deaths than in 2019. So I think that people first and foremost have the responsibility to be educated on um, issues such as this. Thank you. So uh, quickly to you, Claire, what's your view on that question, please? Yeah, um, I actually just got my Moderna vaccine today. I am very excited to finally be vaccinated. Um, being able to see family. Um, I, I'm not gonna touch on what Daimia just said, but I will say, I do believe it is um, citizen civic duty to get vaccinated. I feel like as Wyomingites, at least in my community in Sheridan, we have these strong norms of being a good neighbor. We have a strong community. We support each other, we protect each other. And I feel that being vaccinated um, is part of that norms of supporting your community, of being a good neighbor, of supporting each other and bringing each other up. So. 
that's what I would have to say on that. Great, thank you. And that dovetails with Mike's good comments about John Locke and the social contract. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, thank you. So let's, we're running out of time uh, so quickly. Uh, let's turn to this question, which is a fascinating one from Jack. I've heard that the amendment to our constitution that changed the election of US senators from the state legislatures of each state to popular elections, which was the 17th amendment, resulted in the loss of states' rights because there's no longer an institution to watchdog states' rights and that states have become more, uh, have become mere lobbyists to the federal government. Uh, any thoughts on that? Let's turn first of all to Darren. Do you believe there's an adequate watchdog, a protector for states' rights? Uh, and, and, and we only have about a minute for that, please. Uh, yes, I, I think the House of Representatives is the protector for states' rights. I mean, it's the lower chamber. It's a pretty direct connection to the citizenry. Um, but I, I do think that there are concerns about federal encroachment uh, under the 10th Amendment. So the Dormant Commerce Clause and, and other devices that have been used to encroach on, on state autonomy. Um, I also frankly worry a little bit about the growth of the administrative state. I think the federal regulatory state is something that the framers never anticipated. So I have concerns about it, but I think that there are uh, systemic protections for states. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mike, what do you think about that? You know, Dave, I, uh, <laughs> it, it puts me in a sort of a bind. I know that I said these are my personal opinions, but as a government employee, it gets a little sticky, I think, for me. So sure. uh, I know Diamina would like to probably speak to this, so I'll probably pass it over to her on this one. All right. Diamina, what are your thoughts on that? Are, are states' rights adequately protected? See, we actually talk about this a lot in my unit two group for We the People. Mm -hmm. uh, we are very much against the 17th Amendment because as the, we believe as the framers did that the people are represented in the House proportional to representation and the states themselves are represented in the Senate. And as George Washington said to Thomas Jefferson over breakfast, we pour our legislation into the senatorial saucer to cool it. So the passions of the House are then given to the Senate for them to be more rationalized and for them to cool down. So I think I, we definitely believe that the 17th Amendment should be repealed. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And so in our last minute, we leave the final word to Claire. Claire, do you believe that there's an adequate uh, watchdog to protect states' rights? Um, I think I would have to agree with Diamina on this um, topic. Um, it's important to balance um, the, like she was saying, like the fieriness of the house with the with the Senate to cool it. So I, I don't, I don't really have anything else to mm -hmm. add to that. I guess. Thank you. Okay. I so I've I've created another question out of that. Let's go back to Darren. Darren, the Seventeenth Amendment was intended to democratize the vote for the U.S. Senate, as opposed to having a handful of people in each state select the senators. Given all the talk about preserving and protecting American democracy these days, are you a fan of the 17th Amendment and uh, the popular vote for US senators? Um, you know, the, the popular will of the people is a critical part of our country. And, uh, but I, I personally uh, appreciate the idea of, of the passions of the House being cooled in the Senate. Um, now, you can talk about things like term limits, you can talk about a lot of other things to try to fix the Senate, because I think the Senate is fairly dysfunctional, but I do think that there was, uh, there was some genius behind the, the framers' intention that, that the people have a direct representation and that the states have a separate representation, the terms are staggered, and, and so personally, I think that those structural protections work. And again, uh, in the incremental way, I, I wish it was a little less incremental in terms of Senate inaction, but um, nevertheless, I think the system is working like it's supposed to in terms of representation of the people in the states. Thank you very much. Four very knowledgeable participants today, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure to serve as their moderator. And so, Sean, I toss it back to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Adler. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to, to, to Claire and to Diamina and to Mike and to, um, to Darren. We really appreciate this. Um, 
as we look at, as I look at the mission of Wyoming Humanities, which is to strengthen Wyoming's democracy through the humanities, what I hear in all of you is uh, an understanding of the philosophy, the history, the um, literature, all of those things that went into the founders coming up with the Constitution. I really like this discussion about the responsibilities that we have that may not be elaborately spelled out in the Constitution. Thinking specifically about Diamina talking about the responsibility to be educated. These are wonderful things that are important lessons for all of us at different stages of our lives and in different communities across the state. So thank you all for inspiring us to understand why we should be, we, why we should have this connection to the Constitution in our personal lives. Thank you all, and uh, we look forward to um, talking soon. Thanks.